Now let's take our Bibles and turn to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and the title of today's message is, How Shall They Hear? Statisticians tell us there are, within earshot of this church in this county in which we live, some 65,000 people who do not know Jesus as their Savior. That number is staggering, 65,000 people that are not going to heaven, that do not know the Lord Jesus as Savior, with a church on every corner, and all these people that do not know Him. And Scripture asks this question, how shall they hear? And that's what we're looking at today as we stand together to honor the Lord, to express thanksgiving to Him for His Word. And let's begin in the fifth verse. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day that you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. I want to ask you just to bow your head for a minute this morning, and we're going to pray together as the people of God. And I want to ask you to pray uh, where you stand this morning. And pray especially for these 65,000 plus who live all around us, and yet they do not know Jesus Christ. And maybe the Holy Spirit of God will bring one of them to your mind, somebody you know who needs the Lord. And would you pray for that person specifically to be saved this morning? Would you pray silently as I pray out loud? Lord Jesus, we call on your name because you are the Lord of heaven. And we pray, Lord, for 65,000 plus souls that live right here in our door. Souls who are without you, undone. And Lord, should they die, they would spend eternity forever separated from you in hell. Oh Lord God, we plead this morning for these lost souls. And we pray that you burden our hearts, Lord, and burden the hearts of our brothers and sisters and other churches across this county. Lord, how shall they hear unless we tell them? Oh God, ignite a passion in our hearts to reach these people who need to know you. And Jesus, we pray that the burden you have to see them saved would be the burden that you give us. Oh, dear God, help us to take your message to these and many more who need to know you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's precious people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. It is tragic, but it is true that the majority of people live their lives never really knowing what life is all about. They work, they sleep, they eat, they drink, and spend their life going through the motions of life, never really understanding what the abundant life that Jesus Christ talked about is all about. Last week we learned that Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And we looked at the meaning of the abundant life and the kind of life that Jesus wanted us to have and what it really means to live for Him. And we learned that there are three basic characteristics in the Christian life 
There is love, there is faith, and there is hope. And those three needs, the three basic needs of every human being, are only met in Jesus Christ. It is faith and hope and love. And so Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He came that we might have eternal life, but also that the life we live on this earth until we get to heaven will be a life of joy and a life of meaning and a life that will bring glory and honor to Him. You see, God wants you to enjoy your life. You don't need to live your life with a sad face. He wants you to enjoy your life. The abundant life is not about the absence of difficulty, but it is about the joy of Jesus even in the presence of difficulty. And He wants us to know faith and hope and love. I heard a story this past week. I read the story of a man who had lived all of his life at the foot of a mountain and yet never had he climbed to the top of that mountain. And toward the end of his life, a friend persuaded him to make the climb. He climbed to the top with his friend and he got there just in time to see a gorgeous sunset. And as he watched, he started to weep. And he turned to his friend and he said, Think of all the years that I have wasted when I could have made this climb and enjoyed this beautiful sunset. Well, a lot of people live their life like that. They live at the foot of the mountain, not really understanding the purpose of God. And they go through life just going through the motions. But the good news is this, there is more to life than just eating and sleeping and going to work and all of these things that we do. There is abundant life and it is available to us through a personal relationship with Jesus. But the question comes, how shall they hear? That's what the Holy Spirit led Paul to write to the Colossians about in these verses that we're looking at today. So I want you to notice first, the fifth verse and what it says look at the middle of verse 5 of which you heard before and the word of the truth of the gospel look at that little phrase of the word of the truth of the gospel here we see that if they're going to hear it begins with a truthful message a truthful message he speaks of the word of the truth of the gospel The word gospel means good news. Now what is the good news? We talk about the good news of Jesus Christ or the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what does that mean? Well, I want you to keep your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And let me show you in the Word of God exactly what the gospel means. Exactly what the good news of Jesus Christ means means. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and I want to give you a moment to find it, and here is God's definition of the gospel. And look at verse 3 and verse 4, 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That Christ died for our sins on the cross. And that Christ rose again on the third day. That's the good news. It is good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. It is good news that Jesus rose again on the third day. It is good news that Christianity is set apart from all the other religions of the world. It is Our salvation is not something that can be earned. Salvation is a gift from God. It is grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And aren't you grateful this morning? We do not serve a religious dead prophet. We serve a living Savior who is the Son of Almighty God. 
Listen, it is a truthful message, this message of the gospel. It is a truthful message, this good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hold in our hands the Word of God, the Bible, and the Bible is truth. This is a factual message. It is a truthful message, the Word of God. People today have a difficult time discerning truth. One of the things taking place in our modern culture today is a shift in the whole concept of what truth really is. Our college kids can tell you this. If they go to most of the universities in America today and they take a philosophy class, they will see there has been a shift in our thinking in authoritative truth or absolute truth. They will sit in that philosophy class and they will hear a professor say something like this. Everybody can have their own truth. Something can be true for me, but it may not be true for you. I may have my truth. You may have your truth. But today, they will tell you that there is no absolute truth. There is no authoritative truth. That's the reason when I preach the truth, sometimes people are offended because there is an absolute truth. There is an authoritative truth. There is absolute truth. And I say to you on the authority of the Word of God that this book I hold in my hand is absolute authoritative truth because it is the truth of Holy God. And Holy God is truth. And when Holy God speaks, He speaks truth. And when we read His Word, we read truth. And when we live His Word, we live by absolute truth. And this is a truthful message. And it's important how you determine the truth. You take, for example, a pilot who is flying his plane and he runs into a fog. If he flies by his instincts, if he flies by what he thinks to be the truth, he may think that he's flying up and he may fly down into the ground. But if he flies by his instruments, his instruments will guide him because his instruments tell him the truth. How will the pilot fly? Will he fly by his instincts? Will he fly by the way he feels? Or will he fly by what he knows to be truth? How will we live our life? Will we live by the way we feel? Will we live by our instincts? Or will we live by the absolute authoritative truth of God's Word? It is a, a truthful message. When I was in seminary, I had a friend who became influenced by some of the false ideals the liberal theologians were teaching in that school. And he was swayed by some of their intellectual attacks upon the authority of Scripture. And the last time I talked to him, he said to me that he did not even believe in the historical accuracy of the creation story in the book of Genesis. He had lost his moorings because he abandoned the truth of the Word of God. Billy Graham had a similar experience wrestling with the decision of the truthfulness of the Bible as a young man. He knelt on his knees at a stump in a forest and one day he said to God I commit myself to the truthfulness of the Bible and since that day Billy Graham has stood and preached to more pe people than any man has ever preached to and you've heard him say it over and over and over again the Bible says the Bible says the Bible says because this is God's truth it is a truthful message you see there are Two problems that all people have. And these two problems are as old as the Garden of Eden. One problem is what are we going to do with our sin? And the second problem is how are we going to cope with our death? We all have a sin problem that separates us from holy God. And all of us are going to die. And we cannot save ourselves. So what do we do with our sin? That's where the message of truth comes in. 
That's where the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross to take care of our sin problem comes in. That's where the good news that Jesus Christ rose from the dead to take care of the death problem comes in. It is a truthful message and we all need to hear it so we can receive Jesus as our Savior. Now let me show you a second thing. Look at verse 7. How does the gospel reach the people who need to know about Jesus? It begins with a truthful message. Message. And then look at verse 7. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Aren't you glad your mom and daddy didn't name you Epaphras? Aren't you glad of that? What, what a name, Epaphras. Epaphras, though, was a man who loved Jesus. He was from Colossae. It seems that he founded the church in Colossae. And he was serving as pastor of the church there. And notice what it says about him. He was a faithful minister. The word minister means servant. So he was a faithful messenger of the gospel. God said, here's how I want them to hear about my son. I want you to take a truthful message, the Word of God, and I want you to go as a faithful messenger and give them the Word of God. I think about Epaphras, a faithful messenger. And this teaches us that it is God's design, it is God's ideal, it is God's plan to share the gospel with all of those who do not know the Lord Jesus through those of us who do know the Lord Jesus. I think about Philip, that deacon in Acts 8, and how God used him to lead an Ethiopian man in a chariot to faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, I want you to turn for a minute to Romans chapter 10, and let me show you something. You see, our purpose as a believer is to make Christ known. God wants us to know Jesus And then God wants us to make Him known. We are to take a truthful message and be a faithful messenger of that truthful message, sharing it with the people that God places around us so that they can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 10, beginning in verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now look at that word preacher because I want you to understand what it means. That English word preacher is translated from a Greek word, caruso. And it does not refer to a preacher in a vocational sense, but it is talking there about a proclaimer. It's talking in that verse about a believer. And what he's saying is, How shall they hear unless my people who know me proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? How shall the lost hear about Jesus unless my people are the proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, God has given us a truthful message. Jesus saves. And God has called you and me to be His faithful messengers to take this truthful message to all the people who need to know the Lord as Savior. Can you say amen? Salvation is solely by God's grace. But God uses human beings who have been saved as channels of His grace to share the good news. Look at verse 7 again. He was a faithful messenger. May I ask you, are you a faithful messenger? I want to ask you two questions. And I do this not to make you feel guilty. But I do this simply to ask you to search your heart this morning. Do you remember when you were saved? Think about that. How long have you been saved? 
And the second question is this. How many times have you taken that truthful message of the gospel and been a faithful messenger sharing it with somebody who did not know the Lord Jesus since you were saved? You see, that's what God has called us to do. And to be honest, if God's people really did that, we would have already won the world to Jesus. If God's people really did that, the world would have already heard about Jesus. With a church on every corner and 65,000 people who have not received Jesus as Savior, are we being faithful messengers taking the truthful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and being proclaimers of it to the people that God puts around us? Think about the number of people in our worship services. Now, I know how many people attend our worship services because you're counted every Sunday. And I get a report every Monday or Tuesday. And I can tell you exactly how many people are here based on that report. In fact, I know that in the 9 o'clock worship service on a typical Sunday, there will be from 150 to 200 people. I know that in the contemporary service in the gym on a, a, a typical Sunday, there will be from 150 to 200 people. I know that in this service on a typical Sunday, there'll be from 300 to 350 people. So what that means is on a typical Sunday, there will be 600 to 750 people attending worship in our services. Now, how many people do you think 750 people know? It will be multiple thousands when you think of all the people that, that we know. And we're just one church. And you multiply that by all the churches and all the thousands of people that we rub shoulders with every day. And we're to be faithful messengers taking the truthful message of the gospel and sharing it with those who do not know the Lord Jesus. Let me show you something else and we're finished. Go back and look at verse 6 and we see something wonderful that takes place. Verse 6, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The Bible tells us here that when they heard, they knew. They knew the grace of God in truth. You see, when a, a faithful messenger shares the truthful message of the gospel with a person who does not know the Lord Jesus, there's something here that can take place. A magnificent miracle can take place. A magnificent miracle takes place. In fact, if you have received Jesus Christ this morning, you are a walking miracle of the grace of Almighty God. That ought to make you say amen. A miracle of the grace of God. When a faithful messenger takes the truthful message and imparts it to those who do not know the Lord and the Spirit of God convicts them of their lostness and they turn from their sin and they open their heart to receive Christ as Savior, a magnificent miracle takes place. Look at verse 6. He talks about bringing forth fruit. When we give our lives to Jesus, then we are to begin bringing forth fruit. I wonder, have you had a miracle day in your life? If you have, say amen. Now, some of you couldn't say amen. There's been no miracle day in your life. There's never been a time when a faithful messenger took a truthful message and shared with you how to be saved. And you see, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Scripture says now is the appointed time. This is your day. This is your opportunity. The good news of Jesus Christ is so miraculous that anybody listening to this message today can receive the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now listen to me. Things don't happen by accident. I believe that they come about by divine providence. I believe that God's Word teaches that He has a plan for our lives. And if you're listening to this message today and you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, God, in His providence, in His love for you, God arranged for you to hear this message so that you would know that He loves you. Maybe a friend brought you here, but it was in the providence of God. Maybe a circumstance in your life brought you here today, but it was in the providence of God. Maybe you just decided to come and see what was going on, but God orchestrated the circumstances of your life so that today you would hear there is a truthful message and you would have an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior. I'm going to ask us to all stand and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior right now. As we stand together in both services and we begin to sing, our pastors will be at the front to receive anyone who would come publicly and receive the Lord Jesus. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't give the devil a chance to talk you out of it. Listen to the sweet voice of the Holy Spirit of God as He speaks to your heart. Step out and come and receive Jesus as your Savior. And church, would you pray and ask God to give us as a body of Christ a burden for the lost that we may sincerely and genuinely take a truthful message and be faithful messengers to reach the lost this 65,000 plus around us. It is up to us. Souls are dying without Jesus. And He has called us to know Him. And He has called us to make Him known. Pray that God will send us a revival and that God will give to us the same burden for lost people that Jesus had. And then we will see a miracle take place in this place. You come.